Hello, everybody, and welcome to Lichtland Fire. I'm Priska Yushka, and I'm the director of Lichtland Fire. And we are here to talk about the art of Rodney Zelenka, who is part of the show Refracture, which is currently on view here at Lichtland Fire. Uh, Rodney is here, and we are very happy about that because he came all the way from Panama to be here for the talk. And even though this is a panel about his art, he will, in the beginning, uh, introduce himself with some slides and will talk about his art in person. And then at the end of the panel discussion, Rodney will come back to the front and will answer um, any questions you may have, as well as, of course, the other panelists. Um, having said this, I would like to introduce Rodney a little bit myself, and so that you know a little bit more about him. And um, so, Adas Rodney Zelenka, born in Panama, of European background, lives and works in Panama City. Having studied both in Latin America and in the US, Zelenka's influences span from Mexican muralists to European artists involved in socio-political issues as masters from Goya to Picasso and Baselitz to Bourgeois. In the 80s, Zelenka started showing in Japan, another great source of his inspiration. And in the 90s in New York, he participated in the Venice as well as the Sao Paulo Biennial while living here. More recently, in 2022, the artist had two solo shows at Museo de la Casa Cultura Equatoriana in Quito, Ecuador, and Centro Estatal de las Artes de Ensenada. I'm sorry that I don't read well in Spanish, Rodney. Um, and that was actually in Baja, California, so that's a very long thing. So please, I printed it out so you can also read it on that paper in front of you, hopefully. The same year, Zelenka showed at Vitrinas del Metro de la Ciudad de Mexico, all three curated by Francisco Pancho Lopez, who is also here and helps with the presentation at the moment. The last show of Rodney Zelenka in New York at Tenry Cultural Institute, Dominion and Family, in November, December 2022, was curated by Thalia Varopoulos, another very difficult thing for me to pronounce, but that was Greek, and Elga Wimmer. It was reviewed by the present panelist Mark Bloch and Mary Rabacek. Rabacek. This is like, you know, I gotta do this again just to get everything right, as well as by Jonathan Goodman. And many of you here know Jonathan Goodman from other panels we had at Lichter Fahel, who he had moderated in the past. Uh, Rodney Zelenka's work is currently included in this exhibition. I said that already. And with this, I would like to introduce Rodney Zelenka in person and hope you will enjoy the evening. Thank you so much. I was at the Met two days ago, and in the Met there was a sec section that talked about responding to war. And there was something on the wall that says, like this, a quote from Picasso says, I have not painted the war, said Pablo Picasso in 1944, because I am not the kind of painter who goes out like a photographer for something to depict. In the months that followed, however, he began work on the Channel House, a monumental evocation of the horror of World War II. It is one of the numerous searing history-engaging works that artists of various nationalities in diverse circumstances create. Uh, it talks about, like Jose Clemente Orozco and David Alberto Siqueiros, the, and, and the, the Mexican muralists uh, had a lot of works on, 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 uh, the, uh, on the con conquest of the, of the Spanish, the now Black Lives Matter with all the thing about the, the, the hard labor. And this, and this is nothing new. We've been in this complex, intense, uh, 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 struggling world 
And I think somehow, even though I don't find myself to be a documentary artist, I do feel a certain call to be responsible at some point. I'm, again, I repeat myself, I've been 70 years old, uh, and I feel that my work had something as a message and a purpose. So I thank you very much for listening to me. So originally this uh, wonderful uh, evening and panel was uh, conceived and supposed to be moderated by Elga Wimmer, but Elga unfortunately can't be here tonight because she's sick. So um, that means we all have to do our best to fill her shoes. And I just would like to introduce Elga anyway because she brought us all here together. So um, many of you may know Elga. Elga has been a gallery owner from 1992 um, to 2020. There's a wonderful typo. It says 1929. So, I mean, no, not that long. Um, but I remember Elga's gallery first in uh, Soho at 560 Broadway, and maybe many of you too, in a great gallery building with people like Max Protag and Moni Goldstrom, and I mean, I've so many. It's like uh, James Cohen, I think, was in there. Anyway, uh, that, those were the 90s. And uh, so um, Elga later uh, relocated to Chelsea, and she closed her gallery in 2020 as a public space, and now works privately. And especially also because Elga has also been working as an independent curator since the year 2000, and that brought her all over the world, and uh, with a lot of travels, and I no doubt uh, uh, she's busy. Um, she curated exhibitions at the Reina Sofia in Madrid, I think not only once, as far as I recall, um, also in Istanbul, at the, and then she was very active at the Chelsea Art Museum, which also unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. Um, and there she was involved in uh, shows and curating and uh, operations, you know, to set up uh, exhibitions from 2004 through 2010, and I think she brought a lot of very interesting exhibitions actually to the museum, and I recall some of them very well. Um, she also, one of her uh, very, very triumphant uh, uh, things was that at the Venice Biennial, she actually um, curated a, a, an exhibition which was called Performance Art Past Plus Minus Present, with uh, a lot of great artists, including with Caroline Schneemann, she's been working uh, with throughout the decades until she, I think, passed very, you know, a couple of years ago or so, I think. Um, so, in uh, and Caroline Schneemann was a wonderful uh, performance artist and feminist, and of course, many of you may know her too. Um, in who got the Golden Lion actually that year in Venice in 2019. So, and then going uh, for finally back or forth to Rodney. She worked with Rodney in the past, and uh, I think we already spoke about that. Uh, she curated you in the show Art and Politics, and that was at the Gavaran Museum in Murcia, Spain. And uh, that included not only Rodney, but Rodney was showing there alongside Dennis Oppenheim, Liliana Porter, uh, who is a wonderful um, uh, sculptor I know, and uh, Francesco de Goya, who doesn't know Goya? Okay, so and if not, please look him up. And uh, <laughs> um, Alga herself is from Europe and uh, lived in several countries in Europe, and she studied uh, language and literature at Cambridge and art history at the Ecole de Louvre in Paris before she came here. So having said this, I'm now not introducing everybody right away. I think what we're going to do is Elga has uh, outlined some questions for us. And uh, as far as I sort of like heard, uh, Mark has latched on to the first question. And because you have done that, we will introduce you now, and then maybe you can speak. Okay. So um, Mark Block is the author of the book Robert Delford Brown, Meet Maps and Militant Metaphysics. Wonderful title, really. He has also written about art for the Brooklyn Rail, Paper Magazine, New Observations, White Hot Magazine, and for abcnews.com. He is also a public speaker and pan-media artist 
from Ohio living in Manhattan since 1982. His archive of male network communication art is part of the downtown collection of the uh, Fales Library at the New York University. His artwork has been shown at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, of course, and the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And I think you had also a website which we didn't include in that printout you wanted people to look at, and which is your website? Oh, with no, articles, website. with articles and writings. Yeah, yeah, it's just my website, which yeah. is panmodern.com. Okay, all right. So the first so question is, how does Latin American art fit into the present international contemporary art world? How has it changed since the days of Alfredo Lam, Diego Rivera, and Leon Ferrari, and women such as Frida Kahlo, Marisol, and Lucia Clark? Where does um, Rodney's art play within the context? So what comes to mind with that is, uh, I think what's, I don't know that it's different from the modern artists, but what comes to mind is, uh, speaking about Rodney, is that he is, uh, uh, you know, I think his parents are uh, of uh, European origin at some point, and the point being that it's hard to generalize uh, what is a Latin American art and what is a Latin American artist, just as it was before, just as it is with Rodney. He lives in Panama. So you're certainly a, a Latin American artist, but uh, it, it can mean so many things, and there's so, and and we're having such a great uh, um, uh, I want to say an influx, but not even influx, but like an an emergence of something that was already here, which is so many uh, you know artists of Latin American origins in the United States, in Europe, uh, all over. So you have in in West. Western cultures, uh, Hispanic and Latin American artists coming, you know, to the surface. And in Latin American countries, you have artists from all over the world. So it's very difficult to sort of generalize about that, that phrase. I, I'll say I, I have a difficulty generalizing about what that means. But I think in terms of Rodney's art and what we just saw him present, um, you know, one thread that is is uh, the same with modernism, it's the same with Rodney, and it's the same with many contemporary artists, certainly not all contemporary artists of, it, of any culture, but including Latin American art, which is that uh, it does tend to be very political. I think uh, what we all relate to, at least I relate to, when I think of Latin American art is like the murals of the Mexican artists, you know, um, uh, the, you know, and what those murals were, were, were a kind of um, uh, speaking to the, to the people on the streets, you know, uh, I think Diego Rivera went to Europe and he, he, uh, he saw Cubism and he liked it and he later embraced it and said it was some of his favorite art. But when he first saw it, he's like, I'm not going to stay here and keep doing cubism. I'm going, I'm going back to my country. And he ended up making murals. And he wanted to you know, have a culture of the streets for his people. And I think that energy of, of uh, political art is what I think of when I um, think about uh, all Latin American art and some of the, um, some of the real powerful Latin American artists, both modernist and, and say contemporary, are uh, people who have a similar um, love-hate relationship with Western art. So they, but I think that Latin American artists are amazing, and what I love about them, without generalizing, again, I don't want to generalize and lump everyone together, but what strikes me often is the fresh approach of um, of of Latin American artists who take Western art and take the canon of art history in the West, and then they bring it into themselves and they put it back out in a completely new and fresh way that's really exciting. Uh, so that's, that's what all that, I'm not sure if I answered the question, but that's, that's what comes to mind. And I'll just throw in one other thing, which is 
Um, thank you for your introduction. Um, I have this archive of mail art. I send art through the mail and people send it back. And it's been, a, you, some of you might know about it, but it's certainly now easier to explain than it was 30 years ago because back then we didn't have a context for it. Now we can say it's the beginning of social networking as art. Um, uh, these, we all understand what that means now. I used to just tell my mother, like she would be like, well, why would you want to send art to a stranger? You know, and it's like, we don't have to explain that anymore. We get it. Uh, but um, the reason I bring that up is because in my archive, I have a lot of um, Latin American artists. From all, and each country is different. Each one has its own character. And each one, and I would say that's true of the painters and the performance artists as well. Uh, that no one country, Latin American art, each country is different, you know. But for me, in my archive, I noticed that, you know, there's a lot of it is very political. Um, a lot of it has to do with um, people who who were not working secretly, but working like part of what their art was about was the fact that it was not approved by the state. It was not sanctioned by the state. It was they were working in, you know, countries with oppressive dictatorships or just difficult, uh, is that my phone? Anyway, um, so, the, so that the male artists who are from Mexico or from Argentina or from Chile or from Brazil, each one is different, but many of them are political and they're very interesting, whereas if you get stuff from Europe, well, from anywhere besides Latin America, it doesn't tend to be as political, you know. And so, uh, if I could say something, yeah, about that's, that's enough out of me. <laughs> but I'm just thinking from what you're saying that a lot of um, Western art turned to be turned to abstraction. A lot of Western artists turned to abstraction, whereas in Latin America they have something to fight against with the constant political tensions and and conflicts in Latin America. I'm not an expert, I don't, but this is just an observation from what that you stimulated me to say, that they really have something to say and they need to say it. And so they get it out there in, in the representational art. And that's, um, you know, a great means of communication and expression for them because it really has meaning. It, it's primary in their, in their lives and their minds. So that's, I just want to throw that out there. No, I think that's yeah. a really interesting point, and I will introduce you, Mary, in a minute. <laughs> but I do think uh, when we speak about Europe, we actually have to differentiate maybe between kind of Central and Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Oh, of course. And because yeah. for, you know, the former Eastern European countries uh, actually have remained much more figurative in yeah. their work. Not all of them, but there are lots of conceptual artists too, but there's a big portion of figurative artists. First of all, they have been trained figuratively more than uh, in the recent past than in Western Europe. And uh, a commentary spans a broad spectrum from the contemporary cutting edge to the old masters. Um, she rented yes um, from um, U of Date and University of Date in New Orleans, and an MS from Adelphi University, New York. She studied art at the San Francisco Art Institute. With Mary Lovelace O'Neill. And do you know do you know her artists? Uh, no. Okay. But I have um, the artist. Yes. <laughs> the head of the art department at UC Berkeley and the art students in New York, the Mount Barbers. So because uh, we are now introducing everybody, I'm going to introduce myself too, not just as the director of Richard Fire, but foremost. Um, Priska Yushka, originally from Germany, lives and works in New York City and is the co-founder and director of Lichtenfire Fire since its inception in 2015 on 175 Gurdjieff Street in New York City. She has been working as a gallery director, independent curator, and art consultant since the mid-90s in New York City and was part of the first NADA New York Art Dealers Alliance Generation from its formation in the early 2000s. <clears throat> At the same time, she was a gallery director in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And I know some of you remember that still. Um, before relocating to New York City, 
She studied critical psychology, history, philosophy, politics, and sociology at the Free University in West Berlin from 1985 to 1991. So now, having said this all, let's go back and talk. Okay. So Mary, um, Elga has a question for you, specifically for you. So of course, we all jump in and go back and forth. And that's the second question. What strikes you first looking at Rodney and Zelenka's art? Well, <clears throat> when I first saw the show, I mean, it's different from what we saw tonight. It's more on the lines of what Prishka is showing on the wall here. And when I hear right here, it's behind this gentleman here who's filming. So when I first saw it, I was taken aback. I really, um, I was, it was so unexpected because I hadn't seen anything like it with the extremely um, articulated details in the faces and figures of the, of the forms, the human forms, but also then juxtaposed with a very like stark, not totally stark, but uh, a background that's not described. It's just, it's just whatever you want to make it. So it's a, very, um, it's a very strong contrast. And then this juxtaposition of the colors that are primary but jewel-like sort of pierces your eyes and it affects your emotions. So I was really kind of stunned, I will say. I was pretty impressed when I first stepped into that gallery and saw his work. And I was, I'm not very used to not knowing what to say, but I, I was quite, you know, unable to really put into words what I felt. But I I'd really got to like the work, especially when I, um, you know, concentrated on it when I was writing the review, and I was able to really get more insight into what the work is all about. Because I think it's really a universal theme of displacement and um, of people in exodus who are migrating in the world and never finding a place to settle because each time they settle, they're hated. They're newcomers, they're, they're threatening to other people, and gradually, as more and more new people come in, the same, the same kind of tensions arise again and again in, in the world. So that it's kind of an implacable problem that's very hard to solve. And I, I realize that in your, in your painting of the world leaders, I saw that as kind of um, uh, a very heartbreaking situation because they come together and they're smiling and they really are trying to find a way out of these problems, but they're, they're problems that are just so difficult to resolve because there's never enough room anywhere where people go. There's always, there's always um, uh, I don't know, resentment of new people. Even if it's just one new person, there's resentment in a school. So imagine, you know, thousands of new people. Human beings are just struck by, um, they feel threatened easily or something. They're highly sensitive to their own survival. And that, that uh, expresses itself in lots of ways, not just from jobs or housing or any of those things, but just psychically. You know, is this person going to be better than me in something? Or, you know, they get threatened so easily and we just can't help ourselves. It's just who we are, at least seemingly. So. Yeah, Mark, Mark what struck you first when you saw this work? Uh, I really like uh, what um, what Rodney's doing with these objects, and I like I like the objects there and the big ball, which I see like I thought looked like a a COVID molecule. So I was glad to hear Rodney refer to that also in his newer work, and I was also uh, glad to see in Rodney's newer work uh, these piles of uh, objects making in making people. Uh, anthropomorphic figures, transformers. Transformers, yeah. I really like that. I like the. Uh, I liked. I like the surrealistic. Uh, just the. Um, you know the. Uh, yeah, piles of objects turning into a person. It's, it's surreal, and I like that. <laughs> but also politically, I like the uh, the way the objects uh, symbolize. Uh, you know, uh, one of the first things we talked about, and what I talked about in my article, uh, 
uh, was uh, the object representing, um, you know, like the, the concentration camps where there's uh, there's shoes, there's piles of shoes, there's piles of glasses, there's piles of suitcases, there's you know whatever of all the prisoners. Like, please leave your glasses at the door, you know, that kind of thing, and. It's like such a horrible uh, image, and then you're painting, and they remain, they retain their uh, their horribleness, but also they're painted in bright colors. So it's uh, it's a little uh, it's a little counterintuitive, and and it makes it complex. And I think it is, I think it's a complex topic. And and speaking of that, I also wanted to say that I really like when you. Uh, had the one of like Warren Buffett and Oprah Winfrey and Jeff Bezos pulling the, uh, they were enslaved by their own uh, wealth. And I think that relates to what Mary was saying about, you know, Obama and the Queen and she and, and uh, Putin. Uh, I mean, it's quite, it's in a, in a way you could say it's very generous of you to give them the benefit of the doubt. like. Let's all feel sorry for Jeff Bezos for being, uh, you know, enslaved by his wealth. But I think it does. Uh, I think it does. Um, uh, it raises the complexity. It is generous because if you can take a step back, you can see that we're all enslaved. We know that everyone is enslaved by their humanity, their humanness. Nobody's. We all think everyone else has it made, and we don't. We're screwed. Everybody else is doing great, but we know that is not the case, and it's probably not the case with uh, Jeff Bezos either. You know, so I think it was a uh, a generous, uh, gener and I don't think you were doing it for generosity. I think you were pointing out that that point, right, right. Uh, of uh, that they are enslaved by whatever they're. You know, they might be doing great, but they're uh, Can I just they're enslaved that? as well. I just want to mention, and this is just kind of off the cuff, but um, it seems to me that competition in our society is really based a lot on competition, and that's not bad. It's just competition, I have found, is detrimental to relationships. And so everyone's always trying to be better than someone else, and that's how they um, establish their egos or feed their egos. But, you know, competition really is, um, it has to somehow be softened because... Um, it's, it's detrimental to relationships. That's what I found, well, in the art world and other places that I've been. So family life and whatever it is. So I don't know, we just need to go to another level. Humanity needs to just jump up, jump it up a little bit and, and figure out how to soften these uh, things by like building up our own selves and loving ourselves instead of uh, you know trying to put down someone else so that you can be one up them. Just love them and love yourself. I mean, that's, that's um, a good, and appreciate yourself. None of us are Picasso. I mean, Rodney's a very, very good artist, I, I think. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and you, I like your works. They are inspired by Picasso a lot. But, um, you know, I'm just saying, he is a master. <laughs> so, uh, anyway. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I apologize. I mean, yeah, I oh, left the no yeah. I didn't need it. Uh -huh. um, let's... Uh, well, I, I just want to also emphasize, I love this piece. I saw it at Tengri. And uh, Elga said, which painting would you like to stand next and be photographed? Because she wanted to take a picture of me. And I said, I like this one. I like this really a lot. And uh, for me, of course, uh, if you know me a little better, I am also very much drawn to abstraction. And uh, or to, uh, uh, that doesn't mean that the work I like it shouldn't be political or critical, but I like when the work expresses something with maybe less than more. And what I loved about this work was that I felt like, because I saw the entire exhibition, of course, at Tengri, that I really thought it sort of showed the essence of what you want to say right now, without even including, you know, the figures or, or like a bigger narrative. I mean, there is so much narrative already in that painting, the migration ball. But I thought it was sort of so to the point, and it didn't need anything else. 
And, and, and I really love that, you know, and that's, I think, why this painting also ended up here at Lichtenfeier. <laughs> Having said this, I really like your drawings, uh, especially the, the more recent drawings. They also, again, from my point of view, they abstract a little bit from the sort of overall narrative and kind of bring it to the point or crystallize it by making it simpler in the execution, maybe. And this kind of simplicity, I think, gives sort of like way to uh, uh, maybe just kind of really focusing on the message rather than on, you know, like a very particular execution or coloring or whatever. So it's more reduced palette, uh, more reduced uh, uh, composition, perhaps at times. But I, for me, no less uh, uh, as critical or political or important in terms of its uh, resonance. Yeah. Um, so the, the third question here is, how do you see Zelenka treating the subject matters of immigration and displacement? Now, we have actually almost touched on that already, yeah. right? And one thing, I, can I just yeah. say one, one quick thing is um, what you just said about the simplicity of the composition. Uh, and when I was talking about the, the colorful objects uh, being uh, reminiscent of the uh, of the objects in a, a concentration camp or something like that. It was like the, the thing that you told me that was exciting to me was that the objects were, were stand-ins for people so that the so that the, so in this composition you don't need people you have the objects and they're like they're proxies for for people you know and, and what, what a perfect proxy you know our shoes our pants, our shirts, you know, they are very much who we are, you know, so you almost, you get to get rid of the uh, carbon-based uh, life forms and just have the objects. That's true. What do you think? Oh, Mary? about the, um, well, I don't know, I'm just mesmerized. I really love the colors. Um, you know, I love the way the gold and the red and whatever else is in there, the blue just um, resonate when I look at it. And I guess they're sort of some, they are symbolic of the people whose belongings they are. And um, they represent them. That's, that's, that's how I see it. I don't disagree with right. you at all. No, I think this, this is mm -hmm. also what I see in the, in the drawings, that they are yeah. so we're boiling this down without kind of losing the message. Mm -hmm. also, you know. um, let's move to question number four. How, how do you perceive political art that is removed from reality and presented in a more symbolic and detached way? Is there a relationship uh, to Rodney's art? For instance, uh, Francesco de Goya. I guess that's more the symbolism. I don't see the detachment of Goya. But, right. Yeah. Well, Goya is more descriptive. And he he's really gets into the nitty-gritty of uh, mayhem and uh, the killing and all of that of war. Whereas Rodney does not do that. He's, his, his statement is more symbolic and it's more focused on the migration and the aftermath of migration of what are we going to do with our lives and what we have no power. We're just waiting. Kind of we're glad to be alive, but we're just waiting and it's becoming tedious because we're, you know, disempowered and we don't, we're not in charge, we don't know what to do. And that seems to be the focus, to my mind, of what Rodney's art is. It's, it's more universal. I mean, it could be the exodus, it could be any number of migrations in history, and that's, it's updated to be in our you know, century from, with, this, with the Holocaust references. But basically, these things have been going on for millennia, so you know, it's kind of a repetition of history and that theme. Yeah. I um I think that um yeah in a way it's like you know the boy uh, uh it's like the literal depiction of politics in art I know that Elga had a uh, show where she tried to show artists that were political but not like overtly so you know and uh, uh I like that idea, and I like. I was thinking today about this, and I thought 
I just was thinking, okay, what was I thinking? I was thinking about my own politics and how personal it is. Like, like, how do we get our politics, you know? Why do we think this and not that? If you think about it, what, where did it come from? It's so uh, personal. It's incredibly personal. Like, why? Like, oh, of course, well, I, you know, of course I have these politics. It seems quite obvious now, and all my friends have those same politics. And if you go around and take a survey in the art world, you'll find out people have some similar views about their politics. But what does that come from? Like, and when we were three, did we have them? When we were four, did we have them? When we were 10, when we were 15? Like, when did they kick in? Why? You know, how were they shaped as we got older? And how do they, like, could we now, there are people who, who change their politics drastically when they're adults, you know, so that has been known to happen, but most people, I think, it doesn't happen. So they stay with the same politics their whole lives. But this idea of uh, politics being personal, so then if it is personal, then you can sort of remove all the, the politics from it and get down to what it was that made us believe what we believe. And it's, it's quite strange. I don't know what it was about my childhood uh, that made me, gave me my politics. Uh, and I guess at one point, you know, I grew up in the 60s, so, you know, Vietnam was going on, so I was definitely directly relate, you know, influenced by politics and guns and Lyndon Johnson and whatever, the, Barry Goldwater, whatever the, the politics were at the time. But, um, you know, I was also influenced by the Beatles, let's say. And so that was like less overtly political and more like even now when we have our, our political arguments, it's like, and they say, oh, well, you're, you're woke. You know, wokeism is the enemy, you know. And what is woke? It's just being like a, a kind person or like being a nice guy. Like is being a nice guy a bad political stance? And does that have anything to do with guns or violence or anything? It's just like, oh, I just want to, you know, be nice to my neighbors. And this is, this is something I learned in kindergarten, you know. Be nice to the other kids. Play well with others. Know, so anyway, what I'm talking about is just the relationship between our political beliefs and overt politics. And overt politics can be so uh, coarse, you know, it's such a coarse argument. And I, maybe that's what I was saying about Jeff Bezos and giving him, let's give him a break, uh, because it is more complex than just having good guys and bad guys. I think one thing that happened in the 60s was... It was like it became a bit like a comic book, you know, with the superheroes, good guys and bad guys, you know. And now we get older, and we all have these superheroes and comic book characters living within us, and it's it's quite complex and quite it can be you know scary and confrontational for us to each con confront our own inner heroes and villains. You know, it lives within us. I think. So, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, what's your favorite of Rodney's paintings? Or, yeah. What? <laughs> That's a tough one. We did that one. Yes. Uh, you but already I mean, did that. Oh, you, you, mean you mean given? You mean given? Oh, that's yours also? That's no, your favorite no. Also? Oh. Well, my favorite, well, I do like the one with the, uh, with she and Putin and Obama and the oh, Queen yeah. a lot. Uh, and I, I did, a, a new favorite might be those stacked up uh, inanimate objects, but um, to relate to what I just said, I think what's nice is that he, he's not, like maybe putting Obama and she and Putin in it is, is erring on the side of what I just said is, um, is overt, you know, and I like, I like the, uh, I like that that could be, uh, not political. You could look at that painting and say, this is not in any way political. It has nothing to do with politics. This is just a big ball of chairs and boots and, and so on. There is a leg in the book. What's that? There is a leg in the book. The leg would probably count as, as politics. Right. <laughs>
But I mean, what you brought something up, I think there is an element in, in Rami's work, which is sort of, because I mean, when you say the Transformers, which touches on like the superheroes and, and the comic book kind of uh, uh, symbolism, you know, I think, you know, and you use that very successfully, I think, and there's a lot of dynamic in that. The way you use it in a very dynamic way, I mean, literally, and creates a lot of movement in your work. And uh, so, so I like that. That's, you know, as, I mean, there are so many, so, so many elements in your work. And I think um, recently I read more about that, you know, we are, people are more and more interested again in symbolism and in uh, surrealism that has been for a while shunned or was not so interesting, more on the sidelines. And now it's coming back and uh, I hear like surrealism is the hippest thing and the new thing and whatever, you know, like, I mean, obviously we've had it before, but so have had everything else before, of course. Um, but what I'm saying is I, I think it's, it's very sort of like on the pulse, uh, Rodney's work with uh, sort of this eclectic uh, surrealism that kind of spans from like maybe like a, a, an earlier kind of like stage or era of, of surrealism up to like, you know, sort of this like superhero surrealism, you know, and, and with, with that kind of uh, symbolism. Can I just make a yeah. statement? Surrealism was, you know, based on poetry and dreams right. and coming from a group from the 1920s, right? And it was a very, very strongly controlled group by Andre Breton and they were not allowed to do uh, that many things. They had to be dressed based on poetry and dreams. Right. So now, I just, I don't want to be critical, but I just feel that in the present day, surrealism isn't really surrealism. People who use their imaginations, it's sort of like the word imagination is some kind of a bad word because surrealism is based on imagination. And it's not really surrealism, it's simply imagination. That artists are allowed to be imaginative and that can't really be bad, it's, it's good. And it doesn't have to be called, I don't think it has to be named after a, 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 a group that existed in the 1920s and they did, they were like the very first that made the definition. They equated the definition of their movement was basically about imagination and the subconscious. But now we, we can say we're imaginative, we can say artists are imaginative, that's not uh, wrong, I think, and, uh, you know, despite the fact that there's a group that wants to bring up, brings real surrealism back, mm -hmm. but I, I don't like, I don't agree with that. I, I think imagination is enough. We don't have to call ourselves surrealists if we're imaginative, you know, because that really pigeonholes you and puts you in a, one place where you don't always want to be. I was shaking my head when you were saying that because uh, I have been hearing that lately, mm -hmm. that uh, it's fashionable to be Surrealism is fashionable all of a sudden, and uh, that the prices of surrealism are rising. And it was only like, it wasn't very long ago, maybe five years ago, I had a conversation with a, I've always loved surrealism. I come from Dada and mail art, and, mm -hmm. and that stuff is related to Dada and surrealism. Mail art is related to Dada and surrealism. So I've always been a bit of a surrealist, mm -hmm. and I love surrealism. and. And I was talking to a friend of mine, like, yeah, yeah, I like my Greek. Like five years ago, five years ago, I'm talking to a friend, and I was saying, I can't remember what I said, but I was basically lamenting, like, where are all the collectors who are like, why don't they buy surrealism? And he was basically saying, and this is somebody who knows at the art market, and he was just telling me how completely out of fashion surrealism is. He's basically saying. Mark, I love surrealism and you love surrealism. Most people don't love surrealism. They don't give a shit about it. They want to con collect like 25-year-old contemporary art, you know, art, 20, contemporary art by 25-year-olds being created out of colleges now. They don't give a shit about surrealism. So I'm happy to hear that it's back. But to address what you said, yeah, like the last, I didn't know that it ever left because if you watch TV, like TV commercials basically just inherited surrealism and made, as well as like underground film of the 60s, and they just recycle everything and sell it back to us. So yeah, Everything that, all at once. Madison Avenue, you know, the advertising agencies, they're surrealists, you know? <laughs> like, they are. 
They're okay. great, they're, they're, they do it better than Breton ever tried, you know? <laughs> they're much more successful at it. They make better images, and then they get lots of money for it as well. So they really mastered it, the art form, in my opinion. Yeah, I think uh, Mary has a good suggestion. I think it's finally time to kind of open it up to new Q and A's. And you, Rodney, may not speak the first minute because we heard so many wonderful things from you and about you. But now we would like to hear from the rest of the audience. Anybody? Don't shout all at once. Okay, someone in the back. Yes, yes. I don't know your name. Isaiah. Yes. Okay. I remember. Yeah. So how, how would you define art? Uh, like as a thing that can be consumed, or as a as a spiritual experience for each one of you? How would you define it? Wow, that's a big question. Do we want to just say one sentence each? Yeah, Is that possible? I think it's totally yes. spiritual experience of creativity. And um, yes, it becomes a commodity later when people want to buy it, but they buy it because it's spiritual, because it's infused with the power of the artist's personality, the energy from their hands that goes into the mark making. That's what goes into the art. And that's, makes it, that's what makes it special. That's what makes art art. It's transformative. You know? and, and people will pay for that. That's my opinion. No. Yeah, I agree. I think that it is spiritual, and I think it's uh, um, what you were saying before about the imagination, um, and that, that artists do... Uh, art. Everything gets complicated because of the art. Is, everything gets complicated after the artists are done doing what they do. Then it gets complicated, but what the artist does is very not complicated, and it's very beautiful, and it's very necessary, and I believe that everyone is an artist, so even people who don't see themselves as artists have that same desire to just to be creative and to be imaginative and to possibly manifest their creativity by creating objects or something, but I think it opened up in the 60s also that you don't even have to make objects. You can just have, you can be creative and imaginative with your thinking as well and your feeling. What about you? <laughs> yeah, I also think art sort of foremost just a creative act. And I think what, what Mark said too, I think uh, in, in a way we are all artists without flattening this whole idea. And we have to find our own ways of somewhat showing this or manifesting this. And, you know, so we yeah. don't all have to be visual artists. You are asking probably about visual arts, but there are so many other creative people, and I, you know, I and mean, they're also not only you know performers or musicians. You know, creativ creativity lies almost everywhere. You know, you just have to uh, basically uh, tap into it and uh, you know find your own individual art form if you would like so. And I don't want to water that down, but I think uh, that's that's all we can do right now to answer this really really big question. <laughs> But uh, Augustus, you had a question. Yeah, it was more uh, an observation about uh, Rodney's work, that it's uh, very uh, uh, of the moment in the sense that what the world is wrestling with is this sense, we call it immigration, but actually it's a never-ending process of migration that humans have been involved in forever, nonstop, everybody. Uh, coming from one place to another, or you can almost say it all started in the Aldegat Gulf in Africa, and everybody has been in ways migrating all over, and the world is wrestling with this problem in terms of having a sense of borders and uh, containment, and it's a real, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a political problem that needs to be examined from more philosophical, greater perspective uh, in order to solve what, first of all, this oneness in this little planet of migration. So I think you know, you're, you're working on something that, that's good for artists, should be stepping out ahead of things um, and then let everybody else catch up. 
Mm -hmm. that imagination. Yeah. Well, so it's more of a statement. Well, maybe yeah. you get the last word. I think everybody yes. is maybe yeah. ready. When I did the exhibit, or, or, or my curators in Mexico made the exhibit, they decided they wanted to start the exhibit in the frontier cities of Mexico because my work had to do with migration. And they referred to the American as the Northern Empire, and it's uh, their migration to the north. And I was, I was, I was, I asked, and I was very, very respectful. I said, "Why do you think it's a Europe problem or migration? This the migrants come from Africa, and they just got across the frontier of Mexico. This is not a Mexican problem. This is a world problem or a world issue." And then I went to the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico, and I, and I reinforced my knowledge that migration has been existing for 300,000 or 10 million years, and there's nothing new. But I wanted to finish with a philosophical idea, and that is the person, not, I can say man in general, but the person has to find out who he is and where he is at. And whether it's Zen and we want to be abstract, or whether it's surrealism and we want to be complex with ideas, it's all about the person and his reality. So as an artist, I deal with all these issues from the center, which is abstract, because the feeling has no shape, to a reality, which is I, eat, I need to eat, I need to sleep, I need to do whatever. That's, it. That's realism. So I have a problem as an artist to decide what to do with my work, that I have a, a need to, to experiment all these things as a, as a musician, artist, or whatever you want to call it. So it's not just about migration, it's about the self. It's a philosophical question I ask myself every day. What am I here on this planet for, or what am I supposed to do? Yes, I think with this, no, should be maybe, I don't know, what about you, Mary and